Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the great stuff. This is the AAS Journal author series. And I am super happy to have Samantha Trombo and Rayleigh Davis with us today. Hello, Rayleigh. Hello, Samantha. Hi. Hi. Thanks for having us. Oh, well, thanks for agreeing to talk about your very lovely article on this January 31st. Oh, my gosh. 2023 is going so fast. <laughs> We're already in January. Goodness. Uh, and Riley, where are you located at? Uh, I'm in Pasadena, California. Very nice. So, I nice and sunny here right now. Yeah, I was going to say, there's no snow on the ground there in Pasadena, probably. So very good. No, but we can see it on the mountains, which is somewhat rare this time of year. So, I like cool. the way you, that you pointed to to uh, your background picture. and There's going to be snow there on Neo, and I'm going, what? <laughs> uh, that is an awesome background picture. Very good. Uh, and Samantha, where are you located at? Uh, I'm in Ithaca, New York. So um, there is snow on the ground, uh, just a light dusting, but it's actually a nice sunny day. Very cool. And what is where is that background picture? It looks like Switzerland. This, this is the Swiss Alps. Ah, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Yeah, there's snow there too. Very nice. There is snow there. Cool. <laughs> Great skiing. <laughs> oh, have you done that? Have you been there? I haven't. I would love to. That's one okay. of my one of my goals. One of your bit bucket um, things yep. to do in life. Very cool. And Riley, what do you like to do for research? Um, yeah, so I uh, study the surfaces of, of some of the icy satellites in our solar system uh, through combination of lab and telescope work. Nice, nice. And Samantha, what do you like to do for research? Uh, so I also study the surfaces of icy satellites, um, satellites of the outer solar system, other icy bodies, uh, using a variety of ground and space-based telescopes. Um, a lot of my work has focused mostly on the Galilean satellites and in particularly on um, Europa, trying to understand its surface chemistry. Mm -hmm. um, but today we're going to be talking about the innermost uh, Galilean satellite, which is Io. Mm -hmm. That little tightly torqued beast. Yes. And so that is going to take us to this very awesome Planetary Science Journal article. It's open access, people, so you can go get a copy for free. Go for it. Spectroscopic right. mapping of EO's surface with HST STIS, SO2, frost, sulfur allotropes, and large scale compositional patterns. And Samantha and Riley, take us away. All right, thank you. Uh, so, first, I want to say thanks to our other co authors, uh, Benjamin Cassis. He's, at, um, he's a grad student now at Columbia, and Mike Brown, who's a professor at Caltech. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so basically, the goal of this study was to use Hubble Space Telescope and the, the STIS spectrometer to mm -hmm. get global spatially resolved spectra of the surface of Io uh, from the UV through the visible wavelengths. So all the way from like 200 nanometers to a thousand nanometers, cool. one micron. Um, and the reason this is so interesting, um, I think Io is a really cool place in the solar system. It's kind of um, a world of extremes, I would say. Mm -hmm. It's the most volcanically active body in the solar system. Um, it's constantly erupted, as you said, due to tidal forcing from its, its forced eccentric orbit around Jupiter. Um, and it has the youngest surface in the solar system as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it has one of the most... Um, colorful surfaces in the solar system. So there's patches that are very bright and they're kind of white or a light pink. There's red regions, there's oranges, yellows, browns. It kind of, I've heard it described as kind of looking like a pizza before. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know how accurate that is, but uh, it's certainly <laughs> a fascinating place. And it's it's really interesting from, uh, from visible imagery. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so in principle, the idea is that because it's so colorful and it looks so interesting, these visible wavelength images, then we should be able to use visible wavelength spectroscopy and UV, and UV wavelength spectroscopy to try to understand something about the chemistry behind those colors. Um, and so that has been done before, but only ever... Um, with very little spatial resolution. So there's been either mm -hmm. kind of full disk, uh, so the whole disk integrated into one spectrum, yeah. uh, measurements of its UV visible spectrum, or there's been highly spatially resolved broadband images, which are just, you know, one spectral measurement at a, you know, broadband filter around one wavelength, which with very little spectral detail. Okay. And so what was missing was kind of the bridge between those two things, spatially yeah. 
called spectra at a, a moderate spatial resolution that could directly link um, things diagnostic of composition and chemistry that you can see in the spectra, spectral features, to spatial patterns on the surface uh, reflective of geological processes. And so that was our goal here with HST STIS. Um, nice. Yeah. And so before, uh, before we got to this study, there was kind of a post-Galileo era understanding uh, of the surface uh, composition from, yep. the, from the surface colors and from that broadband imaging, imaging spectrometry, uh, spectrometry that they did. And so if we go down to the first figure. Yeah, um, thank you. Ooh, very so nice. after, after Galileo, um, they yeah. used the, the broadband imaging to essentially break the surface into four different color units, four different major color units. Uh, right. So they had white materials, which were visibly bright in the images okay. and um, seemed to contain a lot of SO2 frost as uh, sulfur dioxide. We know it's it's a gas emitted by volcanic eruptions on Io and it can, de can condense onto the surface to form frosts like we have on earth with water, but instead this is sulfur dioxide. Okay. So there was white materials interpreted to contain a lot of SO2 frost. There were yellow materials that you can see mm -hmm. um, broadly do correspond to those yellowish hues in that in that color mosaic there in figure one. Yeah. Um, thought to be rich in sulfur, exactly what type no. was not really known. Um, and then there were red materials, which were really interesting because they were constrained to either the very high latitudes. You can see that, I think, in this color map where the mm -hmm. higher latitudes are darker and they're redder. Um, but really interestingly, they are constrained to volcanic centers as well. So you can okay. see that bright red ring in the sort of lower left of that map. That is around the Pele volcano, and it's vivid uh, compared to the rest of the surface. Indeed. And you can see just to the right there, there's, a, there's another volcanic center with a little bit of red material. And so Galileo saw this redness. Mm -hmm. um, very acutely associated with, with volcanic centers. And so that makes it really interesting. Mm. And then at an even finer scale, they, they had black materials, which were interpreted to be um, potentially silicate rich. So associated with the actual lavas coming mm. from, from cool. these volcanoes. And that's associated with the little, the little dark spots you can see on this map. Mm -hmm. And so what we're doing in this figure is we are using our, our global HST data set uh, to pull out just representative spectra of those, of three of those four color units. So the white material, yellow material, and red material, which we could mm -hmm. resolve well at our spatial resolution to just show this is what an actual spectrum of those materials um, looks like, uh, which was not entirely known before. So on the left is the UV. And you can see that there's this kind of characteristic W shape that's either more pronounced or less pronounced. That is just SO2 frost. That's what right. SO2 frost looks like in the UV. So the white materials strongly resemble SO2 frost. The yes. red and yellow, slightly less. less. And then um, over on the right, okay. you can see that the, the white materials have shallower slopes overall across the... Um, the uh, near UV and, and short wavelength visible. Yeah. Um, the yellow materials have a really strong absorption edge starting at about 500 nanometers or so. And then the red materials are defined by this dramatic absorption feature yeah. near 560 nanometers. Mm -hmm. And so there are clear spectral differences between these different units okay. um, that we can see with HST. Okay, good. Um, so, our, our sort of first approach was to do something similar to what had been done at uh, the broadband uh, spectroscopy scale from, from Galileo, which was to try to identify spectral end members, see if we come up with sort of the same answer or if having this more rich spectral information gave us additional end members, something new that we could learn. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Riley for this next section, because this is a really cool method um, that she that she developed. All right, go Riley. 
Um, great. Yeah. So uh, as Sam just said, kind of the, the idea here was um, more or less to look at the spectrum and say, can we divide this up into kind of distinctive end members that are representative of uh, potentially different compositions um, or compositional regimes across the, the surface of IO? Um, and so, you know, the, the work that was done with uh, Voyager and, and Galileo imagery um, had done this kind of using the human eye and, and saying, can we see these visible colors and, and do we see anything distinctive in, in the spectra as Sam was talking about. Um, and so we were curious to know if we did this sort of in a statistical way without uh, a lot of human input, are we going to come up with a, a similar answer Good idea. Um, or, or pull anything else out? So if you um, want to go to figure two, you too. Ternary diagram. There we go. Yeah, this this <laughs> kind of crazy figure here uh, is a a good representation of the um, what I'll call spectral end member decomposition um, method that um, I partially developed and and partially um, based off of work from uh, a paper by uh, Fisher et al. in uh, 2015. Okay. Um, and so the idea here is each one of the starred. Uh, and circled <laughs> little dots is a mm -hmm. specific pixel on IO. Uh, okay. In fact, every single one of these gray um, dots is a pixel or representative of a pixel on IO. Okay. Um, okay. And so using a pretty classic statistical test, um, I grouped these, um, all, all of the pixels into uh, a number of end numbers um, and said, which groups are most statistically similar. Okay. Um, and use those as a starting point. Um, and when you're looking at spectra, one of the things you might do is, is take a model or a library of uh, laboratory spectrum, combine them together and uh, see what fits your um, uh -huh. kind of actual spectra on the surface. The best um, may be indicative of, of the materials that are there. And so we took the exact opposite approach and said, let's take individual pixels on IO surface combine those together okay. um, from the three most extreme pixels and build up a um, spectral model of every individual pixel from those three most extreme end members um, on IO surface. Okay. So uh, is there any, is there any meaning to the uh, random walk essentially here of the dotted connected lines? Yes, so we we start at each of the stars. So those are our first three most extreme end member pixels. Uh -huh. um, and then for each one of those, um, every single pixel on IO is, um, we compute a model for it based on those three. And once we have that, we can calculate a residual sum of squares error. So say, how good is this Got fit? It. Not for an individual pixel, but summed across all of the pixels. Um, does this do a good job of describing all of the compositional variety across um, across IO? And one at a time, we'll change that end member. So we'll say instead of this specific most extreme pixel, is there another more extreme pixel that does a better job of capturing all of, of the compositional differences across IO? Yeah. Um, and so these random walks will be the steps that were accepted. So steps that improved mm -hmm. the overall um, yeah. fits mm -hmm. across every... Uh, every measured um, pixel that we have um, and kind of continue to walk uh, one at a time, which is you know represented by red, yellow, and uh, gray here uh, in these various corners yes. on the ternary diagram. Cool, thank um, you. Yeah. So that was the method we used. Um, and now if you wanna go to the figure three, we can kind of look at what did this tell us about, uh, mm -hmm. about the surface. All right, there we go. So um, now plotted here, we have the three most extreme end member pixels that were um, kind of iterated to or selected by um, this process. And, and what you might notice is they're fairly reminiscent of the kind of original um, visible by eye um, components uh, right. represented by colors that we, we see on the surface. So you have this um, component one, which is quite reminiscent of that pretty steep slope between, yes. you know, 350 and, and 500 nanometers. Mm -hmm. um, you have the uh, component two, which matches very well to the kind of yellowish material um, that has a bit of that absorption feature um, mm -hmm. around uh, 
550 and um, kind of that steep drop off shorewards of 500, um, as well as matching component three, which was those more reddish materials um, that you might see, uh, for example, around Paley's ring um, and in the upper and lower latitudes. Okay. Um, so cool. it was, yeah, kind, kind of interesting that, that this is pulling out pretty similar um, things to uh, what you'd see in the visible. But then the question is, how do they map across um, across mm. IO surface? Right. And so figure four is okay. uh, where you can see each of those. Nice. Beautiful, beautiful. Those mapped. Okay, fractional abundance. Here, oops, let's zoom in a little bit there. Okay. Ah, there we go. All right. Um, great. So uh, now these uh, beautiful maps show, uh, you know, for an individual pixel, it is some combination of components one, two, and three that is the best fit model for that pixel. Um, and so, you know, something that is almost entirely component one um, is going to look very, very red in that uh, top component one map. And if there's almost no uh, contribution from component one in that best fit model, it will look very dark, uh, kind of blue okay. um, in, in that component map. Got it. Um, the physical locations of, of these end member pixels that were selected um, are shown by the white star in each one of um, those is. images. Mm -hmm. yeah. That yep. black circle is is showing yeah. you where, where Pele is, that kind of very distinctly red um, mm -hmm. volcano that, that mm -hmm. we can see on the surface. Um, and so that component one, uh, if we look at this top map right here, that was pretty indicative or looked spectroscopically pretty similar to the kind of white material, um, really is mapping um, to these kind of circular sort of uh, regions um, mm -hmm. on IO surface that, that look like that sort of bright white um, visible component. And, and you can see that spatially correlate quite well there. Um, Indeed. And, um, Likewise, uh, so component two, which is um, the sort of yellowish material is uh, sort of almost enclosing that white material um, across yeah. mm -hmm. yes. the surface. And so, you know, really seems to be kind of yes. uh, geographically surrounding those bright white, um, white deposits. Uh -huh. I think um, the other interesting thing, if I could just interrupt for a second about component two, is if you if you look at that black circle that's indicating uh, approximately the center of Pele, um, it really highlights the very center of Pele, okay. but is kind of absent from the immediate ring around which you see much, which you see actually quite clearly in in the map of component three. So mm -hmm. I think that's pretty mm -hmm. cool, and that's that's Good. really highlights um, the spatial resolution you can actually achieve with HST on IO, which is which is pretty cool. Speaking of, what is that spatial resolution roughly? So the spatial resolution is somewhere around, depends on exactly which wavelength, of course, but the pixel mm -hmm. scale is 0 0.05 arc seconds, which corresponds okay. roughly to 150 kilometers or so. Very nice. Linear spatial resolution at the sub-observer point. Of course, it varies as you go uh, away from the center of the disk. Yes. Okay, let me, I just wanna, okay. Put that snapshot in your mind, people. I want to go back up to this one. Okay, there's dot, there's do, boom, boom, boom. Okay, um, very good. Just making correlation again between the map and figure three. Very nice. I'm with you. Figure four, excuse me. Okay. Onwards. Yeah, so um, that, that map of component three, also you can see highlights really nicely the the high latitudes which are seen from the visible imagery to be to be redder although they do appear um different to the eye than than the plume deposits immediately surrounding Pele and so from from this approach I think it's really interesting um Riley actually that this the the sort of best number of end members that this approach pulled out was three is that right could could you um, maybe explain a little bit how, how we decided that, because I think it's interesting that it didn't pull out more Ooh. than were thought from the broadband imagery, even though we have more spectral detail. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, kind of 
the way that we really decided is, is 3N members the, the correct thing to do. Um, we actually ran this um, process for anywhere between two and seven okay. uh, N members um, total and looked at the kind of of the best fits. So where do you end um, with those two to seven components? Um, sum up the residual sum of, of errors. So how well does this fit across the surface? And what you can see is sort of a, you know, almost exponential um, change as you increase the number of um, end members okay. with what that sort of sum of residual is. And so you really see a drop off in how much adding an additional component um, improves your fit across the surface. Yes. Um, yeah. And so, you know, when that flattens off, you can say, well, you can add another component, but it's more or less doing the same thing as, as an individual, you know, as one less component. Um, so likely two of them are, are similar enough that um, you don't need that additional component to, to describe the surface, Degree of um, at least at, at this spatial resolution. Yes, understood. Great. Yeah. Yeah, so jumping off from there, um, so that was our first approach to looking at the data. And um, our second approach was to go through and look at individual absorption features, spectral features that we could map across the surface that might individually be representative of different species. The end member approach really looked at the whole spectrum, the whole continuum okay. um, as, as one, right? And mapped and, and deconvolved de that into the three end members that, that Riley spoke about. But we can see individual features uh, in the spectra as well. Uh, okay. One perhaps surprising thing was that even though these are the first spatially resolved, full global spatially resolved spectra of IO surface at these wavelengths, we don't see any spectral features that were not already seen at the full disk scale. Okay. So okay. we see them to varying degrees and we can map them across the surface and associate them with individual geologic terrains and, and specific surface processes, but there's no undiscovered feature that we've newly revealed for the first time, okay. which is interesting, I think, in, uh, in its own. So uh, yeah. what we do is we look at the spectral features that we do see and that have been investigated to a degree from uh, full disk spectroscopy from the ground. Mm -hmm. um, and those are the UV absorption features if you, uh, from figure one, which are indicative of SO2. Um, that overall big drop in reflectance starting at about 500 nanometers, which yes. is very strongly associated with the yellow materials, but is also seen in the red materials and even to a degree in the white materials. Uh -huh. um, and then that dramatic 560 nanometer absorption, which seems characteristic of the red materials. So if we go down to figure um, five, I believe. Okay. You can see SO2. Um, SO2. So this is the map uh, of SO2 frost that we infer from our UV spectra. Okay. And you can see, uh, so red here is is more SO2 deduced from that, that one band that we have, um, and blue is less. And you can see that it's really mimicking the um, visibly white regions in yeah. the global from uh, Voyager and Galileo up here. So mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. it's interesting. It's kind of telling us that, you know, even though the very first map of this SO2 was made during the Voyager era, yeah. um, this is incredibly stable. You know, Io is so dynamic and it's continuously erupting, but SO2 really wants to be in these places and it's stable in these regions over many decades. So yeah. um, even though this is not necessarily a new result, it's interesting to see the consistency, I think, all the way since the Voyager passes. Absolutely, definitely. Um, so if we go to the next figure, cool. figure six. Very cool, figure five and six, 380 to 500. Yes, so here we're looking at that overall uh, drop in reflectance starting at about 500 nanometers, which we call the 380 to 500 nanometer absorption edge. Okay. And you can see that when you map this, um, it's sort of high, it's, it's just very anti-correlated with the SO2. The SO2 rich regions do not show yeah. this feature strongly. 
everywhere else essentially shows it strongly. It doesn't make a super big distinction on its own between the high latitudes and the mid latitudes or Pele's ring versus not Pele's ring um, because this feature is, is universal outside of the, the SO2 deposits. It's part of the yellow materials. It's part of the red materials. And this is sort of a difference, uh, shows a difference in approach between the end members, the end member approach, which is considering the entire spectrum to, to differentiate between the, the different compositions and looking at a specific feature, because this seems to be present in um, all of these terrain types outside of the SO2 rich deposits. Nice, I'm with you. Um, but if we go down to the next figure, I think this is the most interesting map from, from looking at the individual absorption features, um, because this is the map of that 560 nanometer absorption, Ooh. which okay. which seems to be uh, representative of the red materials. It's its defining feature. And if you isolate that absorption and map it across the surface, you see Pele's ring uh, pop out, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. Nowhere else at the equatorial latitudes seems to contain this feature except yes. for Pele ring. Yeah. And then it's present in the highest latitudes. And so this is telling us that whatever uh, chemically is responsible for this absorption feature, it has to be related to active plume processes. It okay. can't be old volcanic deposits at the equatorial latitudes where it would be widespread. It's only in the plume, which we know is being continuously replenished. Okay. And it has to be related to something specific about the high latitudes um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. exactly what that is we we will get to in a minute but oh, this is what we can learn from the spatial distribution very good so if we go down now i think we can we can talk about the last figure and sort of what this all means mm. uh, or doesn't mean chemically oh, so um what we've done so far is we've basically, we've deconvolved the spectra into end members, map them across the surface and look for spatial variations that we can correlate with terrain type, geology, past observations by spacecraft missions. Um, we've mapped individual spectral features and done the same sort of thing. And we've come to these three distributions where the we know what the SO2 is, that's firmly identified, we know where it is. Mm -hmm. We see the yellow materials at the equatorial to mid latitudes widespread. And the feature that is um, characteristic of the yellow materials essentially all over the surface, except for where we have a lot of SO2. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. see the red materials in Pele's ring and yep. at the high latitudes <laughs> and the 560 nanometer feature, which is its defining characteristic also mm -hmm. only in Pele's ring and at the high latitudes. And so the question is, okay, that's all very nice, um, but what does it actually mean in terms of composition? And what is it telling us about IO's surface chemistry? And here we run into a little bit of a conundrum because um, you can see from this, this figure where we're plotting numerous sulfur species that have been discussed in the past over decades for mm -hmm. as potential um, candidates for the surface of IO. And you can see how similar they look at these wavelengths. Okay. Um, the features we're looking at, they're very broad. They, if they're both <laughs> present on the surface, they're probably interacting with each other in terms of, you know, overlapping in wavelength. And they're not necessarily very easy to disentangle from one another. And so the approach we took in terms of interpreting all of this was we we said that we're going to look for a combination of spectral plausibility in terms of how well does what we actually see in our spectra resemble something from the laboratory. Okay. And um, like a and um, conceptual um, plausibility in terms of how well does if it, if it is that species, how well does it match an actual conceptual model for why it is where it is on the surface? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? And so uh, if we look at, we, so excluding SO2, since we already know what that is and it's, and it's firmly identified on the surface, if right. we look at that, that first feature that um, 
380 to 500 nanometer band edge, you can see that it's it's seen to a degree with varying wavelength shifts and slightly different slopes in mm -hmm. all these spectra of, of sulfurous materials. Um, we know from chemistry that S8 is the most stable form of sulfur okay. at those surface conditions. Um, you can see that it's a reasonable match to the spectra, mm -hmm. so that is probably mm -hmm. present, but there is some disagreement, I think, in the three to 400 nanometer region where you see that there is a more gradual slope transition in those spectra of IO than you see in yeah. S8, for instance. Yes. And so we suggest, um, and others have also suggested in the past, that this probably means there's contributions of other sulfur materials like polymeric sulfur or S mu, which okay. is represented by that sulfur melt freeze spectrum there. Mm -hmm. um, this is something mm -hmm. that you get in the laboratory when you have high temperature liquid sulfur and then you quench it, okay. you, you cool it down, you make solid sulfur, you get these long polymers of sulfur that have slightly different spectral shapes and which experiments have suggested could be long lived on IO. And uh, so we think... Okay. In agreement with past studies, this is really the most plausible chemistry behind this absorption. And it just means that there's sulfur both in its stable form and probably in long-lived forms, uh, which represent qu uh, quenched sulfur that was once high temperature, wide widespread on IO at the equatorial to mid-latitudes within the yellow materials and also within the red materials. Um, if we go and we look at that last absorption feature at 560 nanometers, you can see it in that red spectrum in yes. the bottom of that plot. Yes. And then you have, yep, that one. And then you, you can see that some of these materials do have some something going on at those wavelengths. Um, yeah. sodium, sodium sulfide has an absorption there. Yep. S4 has a nearby absorption there. Mm -hmm. um, S2O has a, a massive absorption that kind of bottoms out right there. Yep. And so, again, we take this, this kind of dual approach of, is it spectrally plausible and does it actually make sense with, with where we see it? Um, so I think you would say that by looking at this plot, Na2S is probably the most spectrally plausible just based on a direct comparison between our spectrum and whatever spectra were, were available from laboratory okay. experiment. Um, but I don't think it makes the most sense. So um, okay. we know there's sodium on IO. We know it's in its atmosphere, but it's been, but we also know that there's sodium chloride, which is present mm -hmm. in enough amounts to account for, for all the sodium okay. uh, yeah. atoms and ions that we see. And so we don't really require another source of sodium. And the sodium that we see is a minor component compared to sulfur and compared to SO2. So if you had, if even if it was all in the form of sodium sulfide, it's unlikely to account for this dramatic feature that we see across the surface. Yeah, just sheer abundance. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Right. Right. Um, and so then we come to to basically the only other candidate on here, which is which is S4, uh, also thought to be responsible for that little um, spectral indent near five. 50 in the red sulfur glass spectrum okay. and possibly contributing to the overall absorption in that S2O spectrum. Yes. So mm -hmm. S4 on its own, as you can see in that top region, doesn't provide a very satisfactory spectral match to what we actually see on IO, <laughs> but I think it's pretty poorly understood. Um, so it's been invoked to account for a lot of broad sort of nebulous absorption in that general wavelength range in various sulfur melt experiments for various uh, different compositions of sulfur mixes. And mm -hmm. so I think it is spectrally plausible enough. Um, and what's really important about S4 is that I think it's conceptually very plausible. 
it it fits a story for why we see see it see it where we see it on the surface. So this feature is only seen in the in the plume fallout of Pele mm -hmm. and at the high latitudes. That tells us that it has to be related to these processes. And S four is highly unstable at IO surface conditions. Mm -hmm. And so because it is unstable, in order to mm -hmm. see it, it would have to be continuously produced. Right. So that makes sense for Pele's plume. We know there's S2 in the plume. And so you can form S4 from S2 via uh, surface processes once it once it condenses. And so mm -hmm. I think that that explanation fits, right? Is we see this unstable species only where it's being continuously produced right in the plume. As for why we also see it at the high latitudes, I think right. that is a little bit more of a mystery. Um, it could be that you have um, higher uh, particle radiation at the high latitudes because you have a little bit lower atmospheric density. Okay. And we know that you can form this species from irradiating um, S8 okay. Okay. with different types of particles. And so perhaps okay. if you have higher levels of particle bombardment at the high latitudes, you could be continuously creating it via that avenue and mm. potentially even um, preserving it for longer periods of time because your temperatures are reduced. So it's unstable. It would eventually like to reform into the more stable form S8, but that is, you know, kinetically slowed down by the low temperatures at the high latitudes. And yeah. so that's sort of the conceptual model yeah. that we suggest in this paper. Um, it's been suggested before by others who have considered um, S4 as a potential species. And I think it just really fits with the geographic distribution that we see um, from the HST spectra. Mm -hmm. But we really consider, um, I think, both of these identifications to be um, plausible, but not definitive. Because as I said, no laboratory spectrum really provides a satisfactory spectral fit uh, to IO currently. So I still think there is a lot of work to be done and, and on the laboratory side and potentially on the observation side. Cool. Cool. Very nice. Beautiful. Very good. And that, I think, wraps this one up. I think you did a good job describing that. Excellent. Very good. Samantha, Riley, I want to thank you so much for walking us through your very lovely PSJ article. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Sure. You touched on it a little bit there toward the end. Um, uh, so let me let me dig in on that a little bit. Um, so where do you think we go over the next two to five years? So let's say we wanted to do definitive measurements of the composition on EO. What does that take? Are, is there additional data in the pipeline? Do you have another cycle of HST? Maybe JWST can do something? Uh, or is there additional laboratory astrophysics on additional chemicals that can be done? This kind of stuff. So, so where do we go over the next couple of years to get a definitive um, measurement of EO's surface compositions? Yeah, I think both of those avenues are really promising. Uh, so there, there. I know there are JWST observations of IO, both um, with NERSPEC spec cool. and with MIRI. So looking at spectroscopy from the near infrared through the mid infrared wavelengths, which I think will be really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, you'll see all kinds of signatures of SO2. You, you know, if you combine that with the UV and the visible wavelengths, you could really start to nail down kind of the state of the SO2, maybe try to understand a little bit more why it is, where it is, and why there are slight spatial differences depending on what wavelength you look at. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I'm also really excited for the mid-infrared data because I think it, it might be a good chance to confirm the, the presence of silicates on IO. It's always been inferred, um, mm -hmm. from, you know, from the visible imagery and also from the temperatures inferred for the, for the volcanic eruptions, but it hasn't spectroscopically been seen. And so right. their exact right. composition has not been identified. And I think if you could do that with JWST, you, you would learn a lot about the, the subsurface chemistry that's going on, uh, within those volcanoes. Okay. So, yeah. Riley, did you have anything to add, um, for JWST? Uh, no, I, I think that's exactly right. That that sort of mid infrared is is pretty diagnostic of of silicates, and so really knowing 
what what material is is this sort of lava essentially starting as um, you know what what's going on in the subsurface would be um, really important for for interpreting a lot of this surface mm -hmm. I think so yeah so and I'm then you know you could bring that in with comparisons with earth if you actually know something about um, the silicate chemistry that's going on. Oh. You can actually go to earth volcanoes and you know what kind of right. gases are being emitted and, and things like that. Um, but on the laboratory side, I think there's there's also a lot that can be done. Most of these experiments were um, done decades ago and they were yeah. Yeah. done with, for comparison with different types of data sets. And now we have more spectral information. We're going to, uh, with HST, we're going to have it with JWST. And I think um, we can use this sort of um, hypotheses we've made in this paper to make more targeted experiments to try to figure out what's possible. Uh -huh. Can we get S4 to look like this? What types of sulfur do we actually get for these sorts of uh, conditions that are appropriate for these sorts of surface regions on these time scales? So I think I think it's uh, looking like a promising future. Absolutely, I really look forward to. Um watching our understanding of EO here on the surface move forward over the next couple of years with this this work. So very awesome, so very nice. Samantha, Riley, thank you once again. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. And that will do everyone. And I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better and we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye. <laughs>